In this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about gravitation and gravitation between any two objects, not just something here on Earth. So Newton came up with the universal law of gravitation, and the universal law of gravitation says that every mass in the universe attracts every other mass in the universe. The force of attraction is directly proportional to the product of the masses. So if you have two objects, M1 and M2, then the product M1 times N2 is going to be proportional to the force. And the attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. So here I have two objects that are attracting each other gravitationally. And the force F1 is the force of M1 being attracted to M2 because M2 is there. And the force F2 is the force on M2 being attracted towards M1 because M1 is there. And Newton's third law tells us that F1 equals F2. Those two forces have to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And the universal law of gravitation tells us that that force is proportional to M1 times M2 divided by the square of their separation. In this case, that's the symbol R. And I can make it an equality by using a constant of equality, um, g, which is called the gravitational constant, or the universal gravitational constant. Um, Newton's law of gravitation um, gives us Kepler's laws. And we find that Kepler's laws can apply to more things than just planets. And we find we can have more than just ellipses as orbits. I can have a bound ellipse, which is like the Earth orbiting the sun. And those are ellipses. I can also have unbound ellipses. I can have parabolic um, and hyperbolic um, unbound orbits. So Newton altered Kepler's third law. Um, remember, Kepler derived his third law by watching the orbits of the planets around the sun. And it's very specific to the orbits of the planets around the sun. Remember, Kepler's law is the period measured in years squared is equal to the average distance of the planet in astronomical units cubed. So that's good for anything orbiting a body that's the same size as the sun. But what if we want to find the orbital period of a moon around Jupiter or a planet around a star other than our sun? Well, Newton gave us the method to do that. So this is Newton's version of Kepler's law. It is still the period squared is equal to the average distance cubed, but now there's a corrective factor in front to take care of the difference in the masses. So I can rearrange this equation to a very useful form that tells me the sum of the two masses, so the sum of the sun plus the sum of, say, the Earth, is going to equal this value, 4 pi squared over the universal gravitational constant, and then the average distance cubed divided by the period squared. Here they're working with Newton's form. We have to be very careful about our units. For the masses, I have to use kilograms. For the average separation, I need to use meters. And for the orbital period, I need to use seconds. The value of the universal constant of gravitation is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. On the website and in ANGEL, um, you will find a worksheet. And this worksheet will help you deal with Newton's version of Kepler's law. And there's a couple exercises, so be sure to put those in the drop box for this lesson. So we can use Newton's third law, or Newton's laws, to figure out why everything falls at the same rate. Newton's law says the force is the mass times the acceleration, or the acceleration is the force divided by the mass. So Newton's law of gravitation tells us that the force on a rock is equal to the constant times the product of the masses divided by their separation of their centers squared. So if I put this force into the acceleration for the rock, I get an equation, which is the product of the masses over r squared times the mass of the rock. Notice here that the mass of the rock cancels out, and I'm left with a constant. So here close to the surface of the Earth, my gravitational acceleration is a constant, and we know that constant is 9.8 meters per second per second. There is a, another worksheet on Newton's law of gravity, and there's some examples here. So make sure you also put that in the Dropbox for this lesson. Uh, we also want to finish up by talking about orbits and tides. And 
what keeps an object in orbit? How do we understand orbits in terms of gravity and energy? Well, we know the orbit around the sun is an ellipse. And when I'm furthest free from the sun, I have the greatest potential energy. Also, Kepler's laws told us that I had the lowest speed when I was furthest from the sun. When I am closest to the sun, I have the lowest amount of potential energy, but Kepler's law tells us that I have the greatest kinetic energy. So as I travel around my ellipse, I have a constant balance of kinetic energy turning into potential energy, potential energy turning back into kinetic energy, and everywhere if I add up the total of my potential and kinetic energies, I will get a constant value. So unless there's something that causes that to change, my orbit will continuously stay in place. Some of the things that can change it might be atmospheric drag or some sort of friction. I might have a gravitational encounter. Um, a large object might come by and disturb my orbit. Or I might have an explosion which expels some material. Those kinds of things can change the orbit of my bodies. What causes the tide? Well, the moon has a gravitational attraction on the Earth, and the water on the Earth is free to move, so it's attracted towards the moon. So when the moon is aligned with the sun, I get a spring tide or a very large tide because I have a strong attraction pulling on the water. When the moon is at 90 degrees to the sun, those two attractions tend to cancel out, and I get a small tide or a neap tide. So the bulge in the water follows the moon around the Earth as it orbits the Earth. So what are some of the key points to remember from this lecture? Well, we have several new terms that we've defined. We said speed is distance divided by time. The velocity is a speed and a direction, so it has two pieces of information. Acceleration is a change in velocity. Momentum we defined to be mass times velocity, and we found that it is conserved if there are no external forces. We defined a force to be a change in momentum divided by the time it takes for that change. Mass is a resistance to a force, sometimes called inertia. And your weight is the gravitational force on your mass. So the weight and mass are different things. If you are weightless, you know you are in free fall. Isaac Newton changed the way we see the universe by discovering the laws of motion and gravitation and by realizing that the laws we observe here on Earth are the same as the laws that define what happens to the stars and the planets. Newton has three laws. The first law says an object will move at constant velocity unless an external force acts upon it. The second law says a force is equal to a mass times an acceleration. And the third law says for every force there is an equal and oppositely directed reaction force. So there's a few more um, of this review. Um, you will want to look at the slides on your own and look at the review section in the book. And as always, let me know if you have any more questions. Well, that's lesson four. Um, there's a lot of information in lesson four and also a lot of handouts for you to work through. Um, I think the handouts will help prepare you for the midterm as well as help you do a better job on the um, homework, on the Mastering Astronomy homework. Um, we covered Newton's laws. Um, we defined several terms that we use in motion. Um, we also learned that energy is conserved, and it's that conservation of energy that causes the planets to orbit that the way they do and gives us Kepler's laws. So, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and I will talk to you in Lesson 5.